Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Booth, and I'm the Director of Quality Control at Inorganic Ventures, and I will serve as your moderator for today's presentation. The webinar today will focus on arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury analyzed in trace ICP analyses. Our presenters will review current specifications in the pharmaceutical, food, and cannabis industries. They will also discuss techniques for sample preparation, address common compatibility and stability concerns, and examine issues specific to ICP OES and ICP mass spec testing of these analytes. Our presenters today are Autumn Phillips and Dr. Leslie Owens. Autumn Phillips is an R&D chemist at Inorganic Ventures with experience in bulk scale manufacturing, reaction, and purification performance and improvement. She also has several years of experience in manufacturing custom CRM products. Autumn has received a Bachelor of Science degree in Biochemistry and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chemistry from Virginia Tech. Dr. Leslie Owens is an analytical chemist with research specialties including chromium speciation, environmental sample design, elemental spectroscopy, and metal contamination in food products. Dr. Owens graduated from Emory & Henry with a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and a minor in Mathematics. Dr. Owens is also a Cunningham Fellow and received a PhD in Analytical Chemistry from Virginia Tech. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to attend this webinar. We at Inorganic Ventures would like to wish everyone a happy World Quality Week and a happy Veterans Day. Thank you to all the veterans for your service. Uh, before we get into the presentations, um, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. There's going to be a Q&A session directly after the presentation, so please submit any questions through the Q&A window in Zoom. Um, if you have any questions or issues about submitting questions, please reach out to uh, me directly through the chat window. And without further ado, we'll begin the presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. For our purposes today, we're going to limit our discussion to ICP techniques, and we're going to share OES and mass spec information, so just those two applications. Also, we're going to further reduce our conversation to the big four, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, and lead. So let's get started. Today's webinar will be divided into three sections. First, we'll look at an overview of testing where we're gonna focus on the current regulations and the industries that are impacted. You know, we'll take a look at those who are testing for heavy metals. We're also gonna take a look at some recent headlines for heavy metals and how we see the future of heavy, heavy metal testing trending. Then Autumn will walk element by element through the big four and provide you with information for issues that you may encounter during testing. She's going to discuss instrumental concerns, such as washout and interferences, considerations for designing and handling working solutions, and tips for sample preparation. And finally, in the last section, we'll briefly discuss products available from Inorganic Ventures and the support that's also available from our technical team. Heavy metals are all around us. They're in the food we eat and its packaging, the medicines we take, the paint we use in our homes, the toys our children play with, and in our electronics. Every industry supplying materials to consumers is impacted by regulations on heavy metals, and consequently, these industries must have testing programs to ensure compliance with these regulations. There are many regulations for heavy metal testing. In fact, far too many for me to provide a comprehensive list for you here today, but I will share a few examples to illustrate the magnitude of heavy metal testing. Organizations such as the US Pharmacopeia or USP and the US Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, regulate heavy metals in things like pharmaceutical products and drinking water, for example. And the CPSA, or Consumer Product Safety Act, um, that governs the amount of lead in consumer products. Um, notably, this is going to be for paint. Uh, it's also for children's products like toys. Uh, we have ASTM uh, standard F9363-17, excuse me, is in place for the testing of toys, and this sets the limit on the surface coatings, um, and, and it only allows um, 
arsenic, mercury, cadmium, and lead at less than 25 ppm, less than 60 ppm, less than 75 ppm, and less than 90 ppm, respectively. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration, regulates the amount of mercury in things like fish and cosmetics. Um, the agency sets these limits at 1 ppm for each of these categories. Additionally, any color additives used in cosmetic products may not exceed 3 ppm of arsenic. Okay, so many types of cosmetic products will fall under the FDA's regulations for heavy metals. Um, these include lipsticks, eyeshadows, and body lotions, just to name a few. Continuing our discussion on current regulations, the amount of mercury is restricted to no more than 25 ppm by weight per button cell for batteries. So these are the little disc shaped batteries commonly used in hearing aids or watches. Um, so the Mercury Containing and Rechargeable Battery Management Act does not allow the manufacture, import, sale, or distribution of batteries that contain more than the allowable amounts of mercury. So this act also establishes battery recycling programs that focus on reclaiming metals contained in rechargeable batteries. So namely lead and cadmium in lead acid batteries and nickel cadmium batteries respectively. The goal is to minimize the amount of heavy metals in our waste streams that ultimately wind up in our landfills and can impact uh, systems such as groundwater and uh, soil systems. ROHS is the restriction on the use of certain hazardous substances. There are 10 regulated substances under this directive and three of the big four are on this list. Uh, notably, arsenic is not on this list. ROHS uh, originated in the EU and this directive regulates uh, electronics and their parts. It's also helping to shape US policies with several states adopting similar guidelines. Consumer product packaging is also regulated under the model toxics in packaging legislation and that sets the limits of cadmium, mercury, and lead in product packaging to less than 100 ppm by weight. California Proposition 65, also revert, referred to as Prop 65, maintains a list of restricted chemicals and these contain um, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. The maximum allowable concentration of each element will vary according to product under Prop 65. Due to the widespread nature of heavy metals in consumer products and the multitude of regulations, which we've seen in the last few slides, um, it's not surprising that some products will exceed the limits that are set forth. In those cases, recalls and public notices are issued. In the last month alone, um, here are two examples of products uh, being recalled due to heavy metals. First, on October 8th, a baby food manufacturer issued a voluntary recall of infant rice cereal. Some samples were found to have more than the allowable limit for inorganic arsenic. So that's set at 100 ppb in 2020. So some advocates will argue that this limit is far too high. So that 100 ppb limit was established with cancer as the main health risk. Some will argue that a lower level is needed to address the risk of neurological damage that can occur in developing infant brains. The second recall was issued on October 28th, um, and this happened when a furniture manufacturer recalled some tables and chairs. And in this particular recall, the paint on the surface of this particular furniture exceeds the limit for lead. And that limit is set at 90 ppm. So regulations are becoming more stringent across all industries. The food and beverage industry is one that's really being impacted. And if you dig down a little deeper, it's specifically the baby food industry. So as we saw in this recall, um, it's important for big four testing in baby food. So much so that it, the World Health Organization includes arsenic 
in the inorganic form, mercury, cadmium, and lead on its list of top 10 chemicals of concern for infants and children. So this is a driving force um, that's behind the Baby Food Act, which was introduced this year. The uh, House Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy launched an investigation uh, which found unacceptable levels of the big four when compared to the limits set for bottled water. Okay. Most uh, recently, the subcommittee released a report in late September of this year that points to the need for more regulation in the baby food sector, specifically in terms of elemental limits, as well as what products are to be tested. There's generally no consensus on whether final product uh, should be tested or if raw material testing is sufficient. The Baby Food Act proposes lowering the limit of arsenic to 10 ppb for baby food and 15 ppb for baby cereals. And the subcommittee's findings um, illustrate that there's a need for a more consistent testing program in the baby food industry. We see the future holding more testing for the big four. Although we're not directly involved in consumer product testing, we do try to stay as up-to-date as possible so that we can support the analytical testing community appropriately. So now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Autumn and she will walk through each element and discuss um, the issues involved with testing of the big four. Thanks, Leslie, and good morning, everyone. In this section, I'm going to be going through some of the main issues encountered with analyzing the big four on ICP. I'm going to start out by going through some instrumental issues, so interferences and washout concerns. Then I'm going to go through your working solutions, so compatibility and stability of these elements in solution. And then I'm going to discuss a little bit of sample prep. For the instrumental section, I want to go through and discuss each element individually first. And then we'll go back through and talk about some instrumental issues in general. So the first element I'm going to talk about is arsenic. When we think about arsenic in solution, we may think of arsenic 3 and arsenic 5 as arsenic plus 3 and arsenic plus 5, but arsenic actually has no cationic chemistry. So arsenic 3 in solution is going to be arsenite, and arsenic 5 in solution is going to be arsenate. So the oxidation state of arsenic does make a difference in your ICP OES analysis as these two forms in solution will give different intensities on the instrument. There is some inconsistency about which arsenic species gives a higher intensity, but in our analyses we have seen that arsenic 3 actually gives higher intensities than arsenic 5. This is an example of some results we obtained from an analysis on 10 ppm arsenic 3 and 10 ppm arsenic-5 standards on our ICP OES. As you can see, the green line is arsenic-3 and the purple line is arsenic-5. Arsenic-3 has consistently given us about a 3 to 6 percent higher intensity than arsenic-5 when running on ICP OES. So you can see that if you have different forms of arsenic in your standards and samples, you may get inaccurate results. Going along with the same principle, the starting material used to prepare your arsenic standards is going to have an effect on the final form of arsenic in solution. So some of the main starting material types for arsenic standards are arsenic metal, arsenic trioxide, and arsenic pentoxide. The arsenic trioxide is going to be arsenic-3, arsenic pentoxide is going to be arsenic-5, and arsenic metal is usually going to be in the arsenic-5 form but it is important that the production process was allowed to go to completion to ensure that all arsenic was converted to arsenic-5. Allowing the solution to heat with nitric acid over a prolonged period of time will convert all of the arsenic to arsenic-5 species. So you want to make sure that the form and solution is consistent and is either all arsenic-3 or all arsenic-5 to achieve accurate results. You also want to ensure that the arsenic species in your standards is the same arsenic species as is contained in your samples to make sure that your results are not skewed by the different form. 
This table is a table taken from our website that shows the recommended lines for ICP OES and ICP mass spec for arsenic that we use here at IV. Our most recommended line on OES is the 189 wavelength. There is a chromium interference on this line, so make sure that you are looking at multiple lines each time you do an analysis to ensure that they agree and you're not seeing an interference. One thing I do want to point out is there is a major cadmium interference on the 228 wavelength for arsenic. So if you do have cadmium in your solutions, um, just be aware of this and make sure that you're looking at other lines as well. <clears throat> Another issue that's very prevalent for arsenic is that it's monoisotopic. So you only have the 75 mass on ICP mass spec and there's a major chloride interference on this line. So if you have chloride in any of your solutions, it is gonna cause issues for analyzing arsenic on ICP mass spec. What we, we recommend for this is using collision cell technology on your instrument, um, if that's an option that's available to you. This is gonna be helium mode and it's going to break up those argon chloride interferences. That brings us to mercury. The main thing to keep in mind when performing a mercury analysis on ICP is that mercury must be in the plus two ion form to achieve accurate results on ICP. Another thing to keep in mind is that mercury when contained in nitric acid alone as the matrix is going to stick to any plastic component. So it's gonna absorb to those plastic surfaces and many intro systems are composed of plastic. We do recommend using a glass intro system if possible for your mercury analysis. Your initial um, analysis is not really gonna be affected by this, um, but you are going to see washout of mercury over time. So just make sure that you are fully rinsing out your mercury before performing um, subsequent analyses. We recommend using a higher hydrochloric acid rinse solution um, to make sure to, you get the mercury out of your system. Um, and we also recommend adding thiourea as we found this is very effective in washing out um, mercury from the system. The best solution for this is to add a little bit of hydrochloric acid to your matrix. This will stabilize mercury and prevent any adsorption to um, plastic. As mentioned in the previous slide though, adding this hydrochloric acid will cause that interference on your ICP mass spec for both arsenic as well as selenium. Um, so make sure you are using that helium mode if you are adding hydrochloric acid to your matrices for mass spec. Another issue that can occur with your mercury ICP analysis deals with the form of mercury in solution. So under reducing conditions, mercury two plus can convert to the dimer, mercury two, two plus. This dimer can then disproportionate into mercury two plus and mercury metal in the presence of chloride or another ligand. Um, so if you do have this metallic mercury species present, that is volatile and that's gonna cause some pretty major issues when running on your ICP. Since mercury metal is volatile, you're gonna have a much higher nebulization efficiency and you're gonna flood your plasma with that mercury species and get really, really high recoveries. So if you're seeing high recoveries of several hundred percent or even you know, way more than you would expect to see, this is probably an indication that you have metallic mercury species in the solutions. On the other hand, if you're getting low results from mercury, this could be due to adsorption of your mercury at some point along the way of your um, solution preps. So the mercury could have adsorbed to the plastic in your containers um, and the materials used to prepare um, the solutions. So that's one issue that could have occurred. Another thing that could have happened is that if your solutions are older, if they were prepared um, you know, several days ago, then you could have um, reduced mercury species in there that has actually been lost from the solution because it is a volatile species. So if your concentrate had the dimer present and then you added that to an HCL um, matrix or some other ligand matrix, um, the 
metallic mercury could have precipitated and then been lost from the solution over time. So here is that table from our website for mercury that gives you the recommended wavelengths and masses for mercury. Um, one thing that I did want to point out here is that the 253 wavelength on OES does have several interferences. Um, so another OES line that's not listed in this table that um, we use here is the 435.835 nanometer wavelength for OES. Um, and some additional masses for mass spec are the 199, 200, and 201 masses. The 202 mass, which is the one recommended in the table, does have a tungsten interference. So if you have tungsten in any of your solutions, um, make sure that you're not using that line. We recommend using the 201 weight, uh, mass as the best mass if you do have tungsten in the solutions. Um, but be aware that there is uranium interference on the 201. So again, just make sure you're checking multiple masses or multiple wavelengths for each analyte to ensure that they're agreeing and that you're not seeing some sort of interference. That brings us to cadmium and lead. So for cadmium and lead, um, these sections for instrumental issues are much smaller as the issues for arsenic and mercury are much um, greater than for cadmium and lead. But I did want to include these tables for the other two elements as well um, for your reference. And I also wanted to point out again that arsenic is going to interfere on the 228 wavelength for cadmium. Um, so for these types of analyses, you want to make sure to use a different wavelength if you're analyzing on OES. For mass spec, um, our recommended line is the 111 line, but be aware that um, molybdenum is going to cause interferences for um, all of the cadmium lines, actually. But um, some other recommended masses are the 112 and 114 masses. So you just want to look at all of those and make sure that they are in agreement with each other and you're getting accurate results for cadmium. So this is the table for lead. So we can see there are several wavelengths to use on OES, but those do all have some interference issues. So make sure that you're aware of those interferences for your analysis if you have any of those elements in your solutions. On mass spec, the recommended line that we have listed here is the 208 line, um, which is a pretty good line, but you can also look at the 204, 206, and 207 masses. Um, be aware that the 204 line specifically is going to have a mercury interference. So for these types of analyses, you probably want to look at the other lines. Um, they're probably going to give a better result for your lead. Now I want to discuss just some general instrumental issues that you may see when conducting these types of analyses. So the matrices for um, these complex samples are going to be complex matrices, and therefore you may have um, some issues with salting out. So one option for accounting for this is by cone conditioning. So just running your matrix for a prolonged period of time before um, conducting your analysis to make sure that the cone is conditioned um, with that salt matrix. Um, another option is to dilute the samples so that this doesn't occur. Um, you could even do an aerosol dilution to make sure that um, the sample is more dilute before entering the plasma. Another issue that um, you need to be aware of is that if you have a high acid concentration in your solutions, um, this could cause unnecessary wear on your instrument due to corrosion, um, especially high hydrochloric acid matrices. There are issues for corrosion, so just be aware of those and make sure that if you need to dilute your sample further that you're doing that. Um, also clogging of the nebulizer could be an issue um, depending on your instrument. So we recommend contacting your instrument manufacturer prior to conducting your analysis to ensure that you're within the limitations for total dissolved solids um, or any other type of limitations of your particular instrument. One thing we always recommend doing for any type of ICP analysis is matrix matching your standards and samples. But this is going to be particularly important for complex samples um, that we're dealing with in these instances. 
So matrix matching is going to help account for spectral interferences, signal suppression um, from your high matri matrix. Um, and it's also going to ensure that the nebulization efficiency is consistent among your samples and standards. <clears throat> so some people don't think about um, this particular part of it, but um, your matrix does affect the density, um, the viscosity, the surface tension, and all of this is going to affect um, how the aerosol is formed and is um, being introduced to your plasma. So definitely keep that in mind and try to matrix match as closely as possible. Even a small difference in the matrix can affect your results. Um, and like I said, especially with a complex matrix, this is very essential. <clears throat> so if you are not able to matrix match your stand standards and samples, we recommend performing a standard additions method where you spike the standard directly into your samples and then you compare the results of the sample ran on its own and the results of the sample with the spike added. So <clears throat> I've added a link at the bottom of this slide to our website that goes into a little bit more detail about how to perform standard additions method um, and gives some examples there. This method is a bit more time consuming um, than performing your normal calibration. However, it is effective for accounting for these matrix issues. Another possible solution is using an internal standard for your analysis. So an internal standard is going to help correct for those nebulization and plasma related effects. Um, so I just want to go through a couple of considerations for choosing your internal standard. So the first thing you want to make sure is that your internal standard is not contained in the sample. Um, so of course you want something that will be consistent in concentration in all of your solutions that you're running. So one common option are or is lanthanides, um, rare earths. So these are not going to be contained in common samples. <clears throat> but one thing to keep in mind with these is that um, if you do have HF or fluoride in your solutions, they can drop out um, as the insoluble fluorides. And so you want to make sure that that isn't going to cause an issue. And if so, you probably need to pick a different internal standard. Another consideration is, of course, the stability of the element in solution. So you want to make sure that it's compatible with both your matrix, your analytes, as well as any other components that are going to be contained in the solution. You also want to make sure that the internal standard is going to give a sufficient signal to noise ratio at the concentration that you're spiking it into the solution at, um, because you want to make sure that you're getting accurate results for that internal standard so that you can um, apply that to your analytes. <clears throat> you also want to make sure that the standard is going to behave similarly in the instrument in your plasma as the analytes, um, because you want if you are seeing an effect on the internal standard, you want to be able to be sure that that is going to have the same effect on your analytes. Um, another thing you want to consider is you want to make sure that the internal standard does not interfere on any of the analytes and that the analytes and other components aren't going to cause interferences on the internal standard. For mass spec, um, internal standard selection is pretty straightforward. You just want to make sure that the internal standard um, is a similar mass to your analytes. So if you're analyzing several different elements, you may need to add several different internal standards to account for that mass range. <clears throat> so the most common internal standards um, used for mass spec listed in order from Lowest to highest mass are lithium-6, scandium, yttrium, indium, terbium, and bismuth. So I have an example over to the right-hand side of this slide of one of our stock internal standard solutions. Um, this contains 10 ppm of each of those internal standards I just listed. Um, but we do have several stock offerings for internal standards on our website, which I've linked below, and we can also create a custom internal standard made to your specifications for um, elements, concentrations, and solution matrix. 
So please feel free to reach out to us if you don't see what you're looking for on the website. Another thing we recommend is use of a reference material. So an appropriate reference material is going to be a well-characterized material that is similar to your sample. And you're going to take that reference material and prepare it in the same way that you would prepare your sample to make sure that you're getting accurate results for all of your analytes. The reference material is going to be well characterized and have a certificate of analysis detailing the amount of each analyte in that reference material. So you can validate your method using this approach um, to make sure that you're not losing any analyte um, or adding any contamination. Um, during your process. You also want to run method blanks. So you're going to um, prepare a blank with the same matrix um, as your sample. And the only difference is going to be that the sample isn't added to ensure that, again, no contamination is being added during your sample preparation process. That brings us to washout. So of the big four, mercury is definitely going to be the one causing issues for washout. So again, mercury does have a tendency to stick to plastic components if it is in a nitric acid matrix. And your main source of this sticking is going to be your sample tubing. So that PVC tubing has some real issues with mercury sticking. So one thing we recommend if you are seeing a lot of mercury washout is just going ahead and replacing all of that tubing and that should really help with those issues. Another thing that we recommend uh, for ICP OES is reconditioning your spray chamber with RBS 25. Um, we use a 2.5 percent by volume solution and what this is going to do is it's going to condition those surfaces and make, uh, make those less sticky and um, result in less washout or um, less time to wash out. Um, we don't recommend using this for mass spec um, just because of the really high sodium content of RBS 25. Um, so make sure you're not using that on mass spec because that can cause a whole lot more issues than, <clears throat> than you know, your washout concern. Um, for your rent solutions, um, we do recommend using hydrochloric acid with thiourea added. So 1 to 10% hydrochloric acid with 0.5% weight to volume thiourea added. And just as a side note, this also works really well for um, washing out gold. Um, so if you're having issues with gold washout, definitely give this a try because we've had really good um, results from this. A basic solution you can use is ammonium hydroxide at 1 to 5%, and that's for both OES and mass spec. Another thing we've learned from experience is um, if you do have tea or triethanolamine in your wash solution, um, make sure that you're switching that out before conducting your mercury analysis. A lot of times we recommend adding tea to solutions with HF if you don't have an HF resistant system because the tea will neutralize the HF um, and prevent any issues um, with HF in your glass components. But when you run mercury, um, and it goes into a wash solution that contains triethanolamine, the T will reduce mercury to the metallic species. And since this is volatile, it can actually travel back up through the lines um, to your instrument and cause um, effects for mercury in the system. So just be aware of that. Um, as I said, we learned that from experience. Now let's talk about the stability of these elements in your working solutions. The first thing I want to mention is that lead is a common contaminant in pipette tips and acid reagents, specifically nitric acid. Um, so make sure that you're, you are using um, the cleanest materials you can, the cleanest reagents you can, to prevent any um, contamination from these sources. For all of these elements, you are going to want to keep those in an acid matrix um, and avoid neutral to basic conditions, as this can cause some major issues for all of the elements stability. <clears throat> Arsenic is not really going to have issues um, by itself under these conditions, but what happens is that um, under pH neutral conditions, arsenic will form insoluble arsenates with um, several cationic metals. 
So you do want to avoid um, mixing arsenic with other metals in basic or neutral conditions. Some other issues that will occur in basic conditions are that cadmium um, can form insoluble carbonates and hydroxides. Lead can form several different types of insoluble forms, um, and mercury can form the insoluble carbonate. Another thing to avoid is mixing lead with chrome-6, um, but if you're under acidic conditions, chrome-6 is going to be converted to chrome-3, um, and you shouldn't have issues um, as long as you're keeping that acidic. Um, you also want to avoid mixing lead with sulfuric acid to avoid the insoluble sulfate formation. Um, same with barium and calcium. Um, so if you're looking for a sulfur source um, that's not going to form the sulfates, we recommend using methane sulfonic acid. Um, this is our main sulfur source we use for um, acidic sulfur um, standards. Another thing you want to avoid is mixing mercury with any form of tartrate. So tartrate is something that we use um, to stabilize some of our antimony standards. Um, but if you are going to have mercury in your solution as well, you want to make sure that you're using an antimony that's stabilized with hydrofluoric acid um, to prevent a reduction of the mercury to the metallic species. Another issue that can occur um, happens when you have a combination of arsenic, lead, and bismuth um, at high concentrations. So if you have any two of these three elements at concentrations greater than 500 ppm, um, you may need to increase your nitric acid concentration to at least 10% um, to prevent any type of precipitate from forming or um, instability issues. For arsenic and bismuth especially, um, if you have high concentrations of 1,000 ppm or more, you definitely are going to need to increase that nitric even more to about 15%. But one thing to keep in mind for lead is that if you do have these high acid concentrations, lead can actually precipitate as the nitrate. Um, so you want to make sure that you're uh, manipulating your order of additions and preventing exposure of that lead to really high nitric uh, concentrations. Um, this is the same for barium and cesium as well. Um, another issue with lead is that it can precipitate with hydrochloric acid. <clears throat> so if you have high lead at about 500 ppm or more, we do recommend increasing the hydrochloric acid content. Um, this just has to do with a stability issue for lead, um, or a solubility issue, I'm sorry, um, for lead. So we recommend increasing the hydrochloric acid percent for those to about 20% or possibly even gr greater. Um, lead should go back into solution with mixing, so um, just keep that in mind if you are using hydrochloric acid in your solutions. We discussed briefly earlier in the presentation that reducing environments can convert mercury ions to the dimer form. To ensure that you don't have any dimer species present in your concentrate prior to adding to chloride, you do need to convert the dimer back to mercury 2 plus ions. To do this, you can boil with excess nitric acid, and this will convert all of the dimer back to mercury 2 plus. However, be aware that recertification may be required for the new concentrate to ensure that the concentration of mercury has not been affected. Another thing to be aware of is that any arsenic-3 contained in the solution will be oxidized to arsenic-5 when boiled with nitric acid. Again, in a nitric acid matrix alone, mercury will adsorb to plastic components. This includes container walls. We've seen that approximately 1 ppm is adsorbed to the insides of the container walls. This is going to be a much greater concern for low levels of mercury as 1 ppm is going to have a much higher effect on the concentration of mercury at less than 200 ppm. One option to prevent mercury adsorption is to keep your solutions in glass instead of plastic. However, this adds more concerns because 
if you have hydrofluoric acid in your solutions, it is caustic to glass, so you can't keep those solutions in a glass container. Another concern for using borosilicate glass vessels is that glass is going to have a much higher level of contaminants. So if you're analyzing for any of these um, elements that I've listed here in the lower right of the screen, you definitely don't want to be using um, a glass container as this will add additional contaminants of those elements. An alternative solution is to stabilize your mercury by adding 1 ppm gold trichloride. This is going to add a chloride interference if you're using ICP mass spec on arsenic and selenium. However, this interference can be overcome if you add gold trichloride to your blanks, standards, and samples at that 1 ppm concentration. The chloride level is not going to be high enough to cause significant issues as long as they're accounted for in your blanks and standards along with the samples. Another option is to add hydrochloric acid to the matrix, and this is the option that we generally recommend for stabilizing mercury. Um, some additional concerns do come up with using HCl as the matrix. Um, so if you have silver in your solutions, it is going to precipitate with trace chloride. So you will need to add an excess of hydrochloric acid if you do have silver in the solutions um, to prevent that precipitation. And also these solutions are going to be light sensitive. So you want to keep those away from light um, to prevent the photoreduction to the silver chloride precipitate. Another element that may have issues is thallium. So if thallium is combined with hydrochloric acid, it does need to be in the plus three oxidation state. Thallium in the plus one state will precipitate with chloride. So if you're ordering standards from us and you're going to be mixing a thallium standard with any form of HCl, make sure that you let us know during the quoting process so that we can add a note to use thallium three plus to prevent precipitation with hydrochloric acid. That brings us to sample preparation. So in this section, I'm going to focus on um, organic sample types containing these four um, main elements. So of course, your sample preparation technique is going to depend on the type of sample that you're analyzing, as well as what you need to analyze. So for some sample types, hydrofluoric acid may be required to completely dissolve everything in the sample. Um, but hydrofluoric acid can add some additional concerns for the analysis, um, for stability of your working solutions. Um, will something drop out as an insoluble fluoride if you add HF? Um, and then also those concerns for glass instrument components um, and safety issues with using HF. So you really want to think about whether or not um, you care about analyzing these elements um, or these components in your solution, or can you just filter these insoluble um, materials out um, if, if they're not pertinent to your analysis? So for these types of analysis, we do recommend using um, a closed vessel or reflux condenser um, to prevent loss of volatile species. So of course, mercury and also arsenic. So a microwave digestion is going to be your best option if that's available to you. Um, and it's going to be a pretty simple process using just nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. Nitric acid is going to um, dissolve any, any of these materials for those four particular elements um, if those are the only ones you're analyzing in your solution. Um, and the HCl is just to stabilize the mercury um, in the solution. So um, one additional component that may be necessary, depending on your particular analysis, is hydrogen peroxide. So that can help oxidize um, the rest of the organic species in your sample. Um, but we recommend avoiding uh, use of hydrogen peroxide if possible, as it is very dangerous to work with or can be. Um, so if you are using hydrogen peroxide, make sure that you're always um, being very careful and adding it last after all of the other um, solution components or the other acids to make sure that you're not getting a buildup of hydrogen peroxide as this can cause 
um, actually an explosion. So always add in very small increments and um, proceed slowly and cautiously anytime you're using hydrogen peroxide in a reaction. Another thing you want to be aware of during your sample preparation process is um, introduction of any contaminants during this process. So you want to make sure that you're using um, high purity reagents, clean bottles and containers, um, your workspace is clean, your materials are clean, um, these aren't adding any additional, again, contaminants. Um, you may need to leach some of these components. So um, we usually uh, leach our bottles and other materials in dilute nitric acid to ensure that those um, impurities are leached out prior to using those materials. Um, another thing that you want to do is perform Again, method blanks to ensure that no contamination is being introduced during this process. Um, generally, you want to avoid using glass or metal containers as these will add additional contaminants as well. And that's just going to depend on your particular analysis and whether or not um, those additional contaminants are going to matter or affect your um, analytes of interest. For these types of analyses, a lot of times a small sample size is required. So you wanna make sure that your sample is as homogeneous as possible so that these small samples are representative of the entire sample. Um, so one thing that we do recommend if you have a sticky sample, you may need to freeze the sample prior to grinding it um, to make sure that you're mixing that as thoroughly as possible to get a representative sample. <clears throat> the methods listed at the bottom are some of the more common methods for analyzing the big four heavy metals, um, but there are many, many methods that are that can be used that may be appropriate. Um, you just need to figure out which one is going to be fit for your purpose. In these next two slides, I just wanted to provide a little bit of additional information regarding sample preparation techniques for different types of samples containing these four elements. Um, I'm not really going to go into any detail with this, but I did want to include this information here just for your reference in case you were looking at um, a different sample type for one of these elements. Um, so this slide just shows some sample prep techniques for different types of arsenic and cadmium samples. And this slide goes into more detail about sample preparation techniques for samples containing mercury and lead. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into any of this in much detail, but I did want to include this um, just so that you could refer back. And there is a lot more information on our website as well if you wanted to look there. Um, and if you don't find what you're looking for, definitely reach out to our technical support team um, and we can help you determine the appropriate method based on your particular analysis. That will conclude this portion of the presentation. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Leslie to go into a little bit more detail about our offerings for stock and custom products for these types of analyses. Thanks, Autumn. We're going to wrap up today's presentation by taking a look at some Inorganic Ventures products uh, that are available for heavy metal testing. So first, in our catalog, we have one stock product, um, and then we also have several custom formulations containing the big four. Our stock product that's in the catalog um, is IV Stock 65. So that's available in a 10% nitric matrix in a glass bottle. All right, this solution uh, was originally designed for USP testing and contains arsenic, mercury, cadmium, and lead at the levels described in USP 232, um, ICHQ3D, and that's specifically for the class one elemental impurities, looking at the oral route of administration. So we're talking about 30 ppm mercury, 15 ppm arsenic, and 5 ppm each of cadmium and lead. So even though this is a stock product, we do understand that each analysis is different. And because of this, we have over 160 unique Big Four blends in our database. These solutions contain varying concentrations of each element, and they're going to be specified by the customer. Um, these are preserved in a variety of uh, matrices, uh, including nitric only, HCl only, 
Um, we've got nitric stabilized with gold as well as um, nitric uh, and HCl combined. Okay, so custom blending is our specialty. And if you can't find the solution um, in our catalog to meet your needs, you know, please contact us for a quote for a custom product and we can get you set up with exactly what you need for your particular analysis. As always, we're here to help. If you have any questions regarding heavy metal testing that we haven't covered today, please stick around for the Q&A portion or feel free to visit our tech center. In the tech center, we have a wealth of knowledge and also a forum that allows you to submit questions to our technical team. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Autumn and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Just drop them in the chat and our moderator will send them our way. Thanks again and happy World Quality Day. All right, thank you so much, Leslie and Autumn. Um, so we are going to get into the Q&A portion. Um, the first thing I'd like to start off with is um, we are going to send out an email that has a link to the slides and the recording. Um, but this webinar is also on demand, so you can go back and play it um, at any time if you want to review anything. Um, but those materials will be sent out uh, afterwards as well. So let's go ahead and get into the first question um, that I have here. And it is, where can I find the spectroscopic tables that you showed for each element? Yeah, so those can be found on our website. Um, where I got those was if you go to our website and go to the education tab um, and the interactive periodic table, um, all of those can be found there just by clicking on the element that you're looking at. Great. All right. The next question we have is, uh, which internal standard is good for heavy metal analysis? Um, yeah, so I think um, that may have been answered um, a little bit in, in the presentation later on, um, but you want to look at what's in your sample um, to make sure that um, there aren't going to be any in interferences um, caused by the internal internal standard or on the internal standard by anything in the sample um, and just go back and look at those um, recommendations from that slide um, to help you choose the internal standard um, because there's not really a one size fits all um, for that. Great. Okay. Uh, next question I have is which technique is better for heavy metal um, ICP OES or mass spec which would have the better recovery? Um, so again, that's going to depend on what you're running, what type of sample you're running, um, which one is going to be better fit for your purpose. Um, mass spec is going to have lower detection limits, um, but it's also going to require more dilute samples. So it's not going to be able to handle um, those really complex matrices um, in your, within your instrument system. Um, so it really depends on what you're running. Um, also check on what interferences are going to be in each method versus the other um, and look at that as well. If you're gonna have a bunch of interferences um, on that 75 mass for arsenic, for example, um, you may wanna use OES, um, but it really depends on what you're running and what you're looking at. Yeah, to add on to uh, Autumn's uh, response to the question, so recovery is gonna be a function of concentration as well. So concentration and detection limit you know, if you're trying to run um, something on OES that has a, you know, at a really low level and your detection limit isn't suitable, you're not going to find acceptable recovery. So think about concentration, think about detection limits and the things Autumn mentioned when you're thinking about recovery and choosing the right method. You know, we can't tell you which one to use and we shouldn't tell you which one to use. It, it's fit for purpose and what makes sense for you and your laboratory. All right, the next question I have is any regulation for tobacco and tobacco products? So I'm not familiar with a specific regulation for tobacco and tobacco products. I did find some um, information in my research for this presentation um, talking about hazardous and potentially hazardous um, chemicals. Um, and that was back in 2010. Um, the world is trending and, and that's more of a um, 
reporting requirement instead of an, a limit type of requirement. Um, the industry, the world in general is trending toward more regulation instead of less regulation. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's not already in the works. Um, I'm just not familiar with specific limits. You know, as things like uh, cannabis uh, and uh, vaping come on board and those regulations start to get established, you know, I, I anticipate tobacco and everything else in the world will follow suit. Great. Uh, the next question I have is, um, are there any plans to provide a stock solution option in the future for the eventual implementation of USP 665? So we're constantly looking at, um, you know, changes in testing and things coming online. Um, stock products are, we look at those from a commercial standpoint um, as the demand and, uh, you know, customers are customers asking for it. You know, if we see an uptick in quote requests for a particular solution, you know, we'll start to move that into the phase where we evaluate whether the product should be a stock product or not. Yeah, just because it's not a stock product doesn't mean we can't supply it as a custom in the meantime. Great question, though. Great. Uh, the next question I have is, what is the ratio of nitric acid to uh, hydrochloric acid? Um, I assume you're talking about the sample preparation um, portion. And um, the recommendation is 9 to 1 nitric acid to HCl um, as just kind of a general um, recommendation. Um, you may need to tweak that depending on your sample type. Um, and as I said, if you are trying to digest the entire sample, you may need to add um, hydrogen peroxide or, or HF um, to complete the um, dissolution. Um, but yeah, a nine to one is gonna work for the majority of samples, um, nitric to HCl. Great. All right, uh, next question I have is, which are the issues related with the chiller? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and throw that over to you guys. Um, I'm not aware of any specific issues um, related to the chiller and these types of analyses. Um, just making sure that it's you know, working properly and your instrument doesn't look like it's having any issues or um, the plasma cutting off or anything like that. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of anything specific with the chiller in particular. Yeah, the, the only thing I can add there is if your chiller's not working, your instrument's not working. So um, it, there could be performance related issues with your chiller. Um, you know, just make sure you're following a maintenance schedule with that. And, um, you know, your tuning and you know, running uh, representative samples, you know, you should be able to get an idea if your performance is suffering, and maybe your chiller could be, could be the um, the cause there. But general maintenance to make sure everything's running smoothly is a recommendation for the chiller. Okay. Uh, next question is coming in from the chat. Um, what is the arsenic oxidation state in our CGAS one dash one twenty five mil? Um, so that is from an arsenic metal starting material, so it should be arsenic five um, in there, but we don't um, we don't say that on the certificate of analysis um, because we don't use any type of uh, chromatographic um, technique to certify that it is all arsenic five, um, but it should all be arsenic five in there because it is from the metal um, reacted with nitric acid. Um, to oxidize that to, to arsenic five. Okay. Uh, next question is coming in from the Q and A portion, and it is, why is matrix matching of the sample and standard required? So that's just to um, account for any matrix effects that you're going to see. Um, if there's additional components in the matrix of your samples that's not in your standards. Um, it could be causing signal suppression or um, interference on one of those um, lines for your analytes. Um, it also, um, as I said in the previously in the presentation, it affects the nebulization efficiency because um, it's going to affect the density um, <clears throat> and all those properties of your sample. Um, so 
those are the main reasons why you want to matrix match because it can have significant effects. Um, like I said, even at just small percentages um, and differences in the matrix. Yeah, if you're dealing with high concentration, you know, um, samples, it's really important. It can be less important when you're dealing with um, more routine type samples. Uh, again, the analyst can look at a matrix match situation and an unmatched situation. You can run your reference materials um, through your method and determine whether matrix matching is um, impactful in your analysis or not. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is going to come in from the chat. Um, it says, I frequently run lead and lead alloys. Matrix is either hydrogen peroxide and nitric acid or tartaric acid and nitric acid. Sample amount is two grams diluted to 100 mils. I would like to get better LODs, but I'm leery about increasing the amount of sample um, due to causing equipment issues with the ICP OES. Do you have an opinion on the maximum amount of lead sample I can safely use? So I would say that's going to be based on just getting, you know, making sure that your um, sampling procedure is homogenous. So just, you know, it's going to, it's going to hinge upon whether you, you think you're getting a representative um, sample or not. Um, you know, with the the LOD you're working on, um, ICP OES, you know, if you're having issues with low um, detection limits or you're not quite getting there, it might be something you could switch to mass spec to maybe solve some of your, um, your lower concentration issues. Great. All right. Uh, next question is coming in from the Q&A. Um, you had mentioned high sodium was bad for ICP mass spec but it can also be used to condition the cones for running samples in high salt matrices like phosphate buffer. What would be considered high sodium generally? Um, uh, I can jump in on sure. this one. Okay, thanks. Mike. Yeah, yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, so, we consider high sodium um, just present in the matrix. Um, we will consider that around, you know, 50 ppm. Um, and we'll, that's when we we'll really start to be very concerned um, about having it around. And um, that's sort of in our undiluted sample. Um, so what we'll do is we'll try to control for it the best you can. Um, it really depends on if you're running anything, you know, like lead is not going to be as much of an issue as it will be for, say, arsenic um, on some of the interferences that could pop up. Um, but if you have, you know, a, a large, I would say a two to three times um, order of magnitude difference between your analyte and the concentration of sodium, um, you may want to start taking steps to sort of correct for it. Um, there are, you know, salting the cones is a good step, um, but you will want to just make sure that you're accounting for it in one way or another, either by using blanks or, um, you know, salting the cones. Uh, you can do different, different instrument methods. Um, if your instrument will allow for it, that will sort of help, uh, like gas dilution, online gas dilution. Um, we have found on one of our instruments that's been extremely helpful when we have higher concentrations of sodium, calcium, potassium um, in our ICP mass spec samples. All right, so we'll move on to another Q&A one. Um, do you have any tips in the sample preparation for heavy metals and biological samples such as blood and plasma or tissue samples? So we don't deal with those um, here in particular. Um, we deal with, you know, just inorganic type um, sample preparations. Um, but I would recommend reaching out to our technical team and we can help you dig into that a little bit more, um, depending on what levels you're looking at um, and, you know, more details about your sample. Um, and we can definitely help you try and figure that out um, based on your particular sample type and, um, those parameters. 
yeah, the forum is a great place to pose those questions. Um, you know, it's also open for other members of the community to um, join in and provide an answer. I'm fairly certain that we have um, biological type um, sample preparation information in the forum. I'm just not pulling it into the, the front of my brain at the moment. So just um, take a look at the forum and see if you have, uh, see if you find anything that you're looking for. If not, um, just shoot us a, uh, an email info at inorganicventures.com uh, and that'll get over to the technical team for review. Great. Uh, next one, we go back to the chat. Um, it says, can you provide guidance or indoor documentation on a leaching procedure for plastic tubing, sample containers, etc.? Is PFA or FEP better than HDPE? Yeah, so we leach um, most of our containers and a lot of our materials in just a 5% um, nitric acid leaching solution. Um, so we recommend leaching that for um, at least you know, a week or so um, in that solution to make sure that you're leaching out any impurities. Um, and the container type that we usually recommend is LDPE um, because we found that that is the cleanest material. Um, Teflon and HDPE have a little bit more um, higher levels of impurities in those from our leaching studies. Um, so if you can use LDPE, that is what we would recommend. Data from those leaching studies that Autumn mentions, um, the trace analysis guide on our uh, education um, mm -hmm. tab, you can go to section five and that has information about container material properties where we're looking at impurity profiles of the different uh, container types. And you'll see why Autumn is making the suggestion for LDPE instead of some of the higher density plastics. Great. Uh, another question from the Q&A uh, that says, we are analyzing lead at um, United States and secondly at India, but we are not getting the same results. What could be the reason for that? Um, it could be an interference issue. Um, that's kind of what I would look at first. Um, make sure you're not getting any type of interference. Again, you can look at our interactive periodic table on the website to see um, the interferences that we found um, at different wavelengths or different masses um, for mass spec. So I would definitely check that first and make sure you're checking multiple lines each time you're um, running the analysis. Um, so that's that would be the first thing that I would look at. But um, if you are still having issues with that, definitely reach out to us and we can look at your um, raw data if you can provide that. Um, that would be really helpful for us to help you determine what might be going on um, with your analysis. Yeah, I would also recommend looking at the sample preparation um, procedure. That's half the battle. And you guys indicated that in the polls when we started that sample prep is a difficult portion. Um, it could be that there's some variation from site to site. Um, you know, you can get that with um, sending the same sample from one um, laboratory to the next round robin type studies. And also making sure that um, you know if there's a, an appropriate reference material available, analyze that site to site um, to see um, where the differences could lie. There are um, you know reproducibility issues and repeatability issues. You know dealing with the instrument itself and dealing with the people involved in the analysis. So um, you know those are things you can account for in the uncertainty of the final measurement that you report. Um, but I would you know, take a look at that sample preparation. Sounds like could be an issue there. Great. All right, uh, another one from the Q&A portion. Um, which method, ICP, AES, or mass spec, would be better to detect gold nanoparticle, na gold nanoparticles in small tissue samples? How to prepare the sample for the ICP? Um, we, so we don't have, um, like I said, experience with those particular sample types, um, but I'm not sure. Leslie, do you have any recommendations? Sure, for that I'll jump in. Um, 
I think it's similar to how we responded to the limited detection question earlier. Um, it's really going to depend on the concentration that you're looking for. Um, you know, in your analysis, you want to make sure that you're you're well above your uh, limit of quantification. And you know, if that means you're in the really low range, then you should shift over to mass spec, as you'll typically get a lower um, detection limit over there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have um, experience with. Um, gadolinium in uh, nano type particles. Um, and that was run on an OES. Again, it's going to be dependent on concentration and, you know, where your interferences lie also. Uh, next question is, what might be the problem for not getting a linearity and mercury analysis? Um, <laughs> so there's lots of issues with mercury, as we discussed earlier. Um, but I would just go back and see what, you know, what concentrations you're running, look at your standards and your samples, um, and making sure that you don't have any of the dimer present, nothing's being reduced. Um, if you're getting, again, really high recoveries, you probably have some reduced mercury species in there. Um, so I would just make sure that you go back and look at what issue you're actually seeing, um, and try to diagnose it that way. I don't have any specific, um, any specific diagnosis for that um, without getting more details. Um, but yeah, I would just go back and look at those individually and just see if you're getting low or high results and at what concentrations, um, look at your container types. Are you using plastic? What's your matrix? Um, is is your mercury actually stable? Um, so yeah, lots of considerations for mercury. I know it's always difficult to to deal with. Yeah, I would just add on to that by you know asking is the um, linearity only an issue in the method, or do you have linearity issues outside of the method? Um, you know, it, it could be something in the matrix that you're working with, or something specific to the, um, the method itself, um, you know, go back and review your method validation. You may need to revalidate um, if you have to make a change in your method. Um, yeah, because if your linearity, you know, as the um, instrument was set up, if, if that's not okay, then, you know, you're looking at an instrument problem. If it's specific to your method, I would look in the method itself and see if you can um, point to you know, some of the tips and tricks or use some of the tips and tricks that Autumn has shown throughout the presentation to diagnose maybe where your issue is. Great. Uh, I'm gonna jump back over to the chat. Um, so this one came in um, and it says, uh, we have an Agilent 4200 MP rig. That's a um, microwave plasma instrument. Um, what are the interferences in the boron analysis? What could you use as a suppressor solution? So that's a little outside the scope of this presentation. And I see that we have a lot of other questions. Um, for interferences, I'm going to refer you back to the interactive periodic table that Autumn was talking about. Um, so take a look at that. And if you um, still have some questions on your boron analysis, just shoot us a message offline and we'll handle that um, outside of the scope of this um, presentation. Great. Uh, next question from the chat says, we use yttrium as our internal standard for all of our analysis on the ICP OES. Also, we use aqua regia to, dig to digest most of our samples unless silver is requested. Is that okay? Um, if, if you're not, if you don't need to quantify the silver in there, um, I mean, I, it seems okay to me. Um, yttrium is a good choice for your internal standard because um, it shouldn't be in those types of samples um, that you're talking about. So yeah, I mean, unless they're asking for silver, um, just be aware that that is gonna be lost um, as well as thallium if it's in, again, that plus one oxidation state. Um, but if that's not something that they're looking for or that you're looking for, um, yeah, that seems appropriate. Great. Um, next question. So 
we are running a little long. So what we are going to do is um, we're going to do two more questions um, that we will answer live. And then we are going to cut this out. We really appreciate your time. And if you have, we will do our best to record all of the questions. But if we have anything that we did not get to answer, please reach out to us. Um, so first question I'm going to choose is, can you explain the standard mode and the KED mode in the ICP mass spec? Which mode is good for heavy metals? Um, I think, Mike, do you have any suggestions for that one? I think you would be probably the one that would know the most yeah, about sure. those two methods. Um, for, so really what the, the KED does is it will um, take out some of the interferences, mainly um, chloride interferences. It's used mainly for arsenic 75. Um, so if you have, um, say, argon on mass 40 and chloride present in your sample with arsenic, um, you're going to see a lot of that argon chloride interference show up on mass 75. So you'll have a lot of issues with arsenic. Um, so what the KED mode does is it introduces a um, collision cell gas. Um, and what should happen is that it should take away that sort of argon chloride interference. It won't be able to make it through the collision cell um, into the into the you know the the detector um, into the quadrupole into the detector. Um, so that's really what it's used for. One thing to keep in mind is whenever you do that, you lose counts across the board. So if you have an element that it doesn't work for, well for, so like um, I'm going to say lead you will lose count. So um, what we do when we do a lot of our trace metal analysis is we've sort of run the studies to find out what mode works best for what element. And then we'll switch modes. So the elements that work better with the collision cell mode, we'll run that first and then we'll do a separate run for everything in standard mode so we can get the best detection limits possible. Um, and I'm gonna go down here. Uh, last question. Do you have any recommendations about sample preparations for heavy metals and plants? Um, so it's probably gonna be the same um, as we mentioned for just general um, organic sample types. Um, you should be able to get a pretty good digestion with the nitric and um, HCL for analyzing mercury. Um, but if you do need to get all of that in there, um, there may be um, silica um, that you may need HF to digest or some other um, HF uh, component or HF element that needs HF to digest it. Um, but I think that that's a good place to start is just the, the nitric with a little bit of HCl. Um, and then if, if you aren't completely digesting the sample, you may need to add some additional components. And um, again, please reach out to us if you are having issues with that and we can help um, determine an appropriate um, digestion uh, process or acids that may need to be added to help get your sample fully digested. Awesome. Well, like I said, we really, really appreciate everyone's time. Um, thank you so much for attending this webinar and we will do our best to collect these questions, but please reach out um, to us. Uh, I believe it should be info at Inorganic Ventures. Um, that will eventually make its way through um, and we will answer your questions. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And we hope to see you for the next webinar that we do.